Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Dark Energy Survey, uh, the book launch. My name is Andrea, and I'll be your host today. So before we start, I'd like to share a few housekeeping rules. So please keep your camera and microphone off for the entire duration of the event. Please post your questions via the chat room. And as a disclaimer, this webinar will be recorded and the recording may be shared publicly online. Just to give you a short introduction on how this is going to happen, we're going to have two parts. Uh, so during the first part, we will have a panel discussion. And in the second part, we will have a Q&A session. So please feel free to leave your questions in the chat box and we will get to them during the second part of this uh, launch. So I am joined today or tonight, depending on where you're joining us, with the editors and contributors of this fantastic title, as well as a few um, special guests. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, one of the editors of this title, Ofa Lahav, who is the parent chair of astronomy at University College London. He also served as the co-chair of the science committee of the Dark Energy Survey. Thank you, uh, Andrea, and hello, uh, everyone. Uh, I'll share uh, this screen shortly, just to say it's a virtual event, but I can assure you that I'm holding a real copy of the book in three dimensions. And uh, it's a great moment uh, to celebrate uh, the release of the book. This is actually our second launch event. We had one in October, which was suitable for other time zones. Um, and just to, I think, yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, hopefully, can you see it? Um, yes. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, to put uh, things in context, um, just to say that uh, this is a project that started, at least the idea, started 2003. So this is, you know, 17 years. Uh, that's quite a long time in, in human life. And a lot has happened in the world. Uh, for it depends how you do the timing, but I've counted um, that uh, we had four US presidents over that period, five UK prime ministers and seven Australian prime ministers. So it's quite a long period. Uh, but the story of this, of course, begins with the Big Bang 13.8 uh, billion years ago. And specifically, this idea goes to 1917, where Einstein, in this paper written in German, hypothesized an entity, which he called lambda, the Greek letter lambda, which he introduced for certain reasons. Uh, uh, later, he, did, he didn't like it for other reasons, which we don't have time to cover. But it's interesting that this particular paper has now led to all this work around the world, which, which involves thousands of scientists and, and, and billions of dollars. Uh, the current situation is that most people in the community that at present 70% uh, of the universe is made of that dark energy, 25% uh, or so called dark matter, which is also a bit elusive and 5% ordinary matter. And this is all in the, that context of starting with the Big Bang and then expanding. I'm, expand, I'm explaining it at that level because there are some on the, on, the, on the call who are not astronomers. Uh, others, of course, do it for living. Uh, so uh, the, the point is that uh, we don't quite see this uh, written on the sky. We don't see lambda equals such and such. We have to use all these techniques and what we call inverse problems in a way, we measure, for example, the way the light of supernovae from supernova is, we map it as a function of distance. And we would like to believe that they, they act as kind of standard candles. And therefore they can tell us about geometry. On the right here, you can see standard rulers. So nature has been kind enough to set up for us these uh, features which, which connect as rulers. And they map also into similar rulers in the cosmic micro background. Clusters of galaxies are beautiful uh, objects, uh, very massive, and they can even bend the light of objects that are behind them. And this technique of line bending or gravitational lensing is also appears in fact 
everywhere, almost every galaxy is slightly distorted uh, due to the passage of the light through intervening matter. So these have been four very important techniques in the survey, and they're described in the book in great detail. Uh, it's probably fair to say that now it's very common for surveys to do all these four and maybe a few more. And, and dark energy survey has been one of the first, if not the first, to actually take this holistic approach and try simultaneously to look at several probes. Um, the survey itself, just in terms of my idea, uh, was first suggested at 2012, first light, and you can see a celebration on the mountain with this remarkable camera, which cost something like $40 million. And observations actually finished uh, in 2019, but the story is not over because the collaboration is very busy analyzing the data. About 400 scientists based in seven countries. Um, you know, the survey's got hundreds of millions of galaxies, thousands of supernovae, already over 250 papers. And, uh, but we're, we still think the best is still to come, especially uh, very soon we'll hear results from the three years of data and eventually from the full six. So this is to get you the picture of what is actually has happened with the book we more or less finished or concluded at 2019, but still is going on. Maybe. The and so here is the book uh, published. Thanks very much to World Scientific, Andrea and her colleagues for a fantastic job uh, helping us. We kind of, we had the idea for the book in 2013. So this has been a seven year journey. And uh, many thanks to my three co-editors, uh, Lucy, Julian, and Josh, and the 88, overall 88 co-authors. It's difficult to list them all, but in the book, if you get it, 28 chapters, four sections, how it was built, the science I described briefly, uh, more, all kinds of surprises, known unknowns and unknown unknowns, uh, you know, different objects in the solar system, flashes from events of gravitational waves. And finally, reflections by a poet, an anthropologist, a philosopher and artist. Uh, so this is the uh, picture of what is to come, just to give it a bit of future beyond the book. For those of you who have not seen Dark matter, here's dark matter. It's that patch over the area. It's not with the real data, it's with the data which are almost the real data. We call it, it's a blinded version. And that's a map of dark matter seen with all. Patient is a map of Gaia, uh, which is, shows the, the nearby universe. Uh, so uh, that's uh, the introduction, mainly aimed at those who are not astronomers and uh, uh, we're really pleased to have this, uh, all these uh, panelists here, the editors, some of the authors, and also special guests uh, with us. And uh, uh, thank you. Thanks for listening. And, and back to you, Andrea. Thank you very much, Ofa. Now we're moving to our second editor, Lucy Calder, who has an MSc in astrophysics and um, MRes in anthropology from UCL, where she studied the history of dark energy and a dark energy survey. Hello, so yeah, I'm Lucy Calder. I seem to have a terrible internet connection, so let's hope I don't disappear. Um, I'm one of the editors of the book. I also helped to research and write a reasonable proportion of it. Um, I first got involved with the Dark Energy Survey in 2013, and I started work on the book in 2015. And I have some slides to show you. Um, there we are. Um, so this is the cover of the book, and the idea is to give the readers an authentic picture of how the Dark Energy Survey came into being, its purpose, how it functioned, and what it achieved. This includes an explanation of the underlying science for non-specialists, a summary of results so far, and the potential for future discoveries. Um, we wanted to cover, at least briefly, every aspect of the project, and we decided that the most interesting approach was to ask the scientists who've actually led the project to tell the story in their own words. As far as we know, no book about a major science project has been written from the inside before. So science is a human endeavor. So we ask that people include, if possible, an insight into the process of doing science, some of the challenges and triumphs they met along the way. Um, scientific findings are enabled by the specific context out of which they arise. And whatever knowledge we have is the result of a network of circumstances and a team of individuals working together. 
by showing the whole scope of the DES project in this book. And by the way, DES or DES is shorthand for Dark Energy Survey. Um, we hope to give readers a better understanding about science in action and what it takes to learn more about the universe. It requires a coordinated input of ideas, skills and work of every kind over, in the case of DES, it will be about a 20 year period. So the book is divided into four parts and I'll give you now a very quick preview of the content of these sections. Each of the 28 chapters is written in a slightly different style and can be read as a self-contained unit. So we begin with a wonderful foreword and then an introduction to dark energy and the dark energy um, survey. So this introductory chapter is available as a free PDF on the World Scientific website. Um, I'm not going to mention any author names because there are simply too many, but you can read them here and I'll let them speak for themselves. The first section is called Building the Dark Energy Survey. And it begins with a substantial chapter led by the first DES director with contributions from leading astronomies as astronomers at CTIO. Um, which describes how the project went from an idea to reality, how the famous Blanco telescope got involved, how the idea for the survey developed and how the first funding was secured. Then there's a chapter on the incredible story behind the camera, DCAM, which was built at Fermilab and the optical corrector, which was built at UCL. Um, and this um, is an engineering drawing of DCAM taken from chapter two. Then we have installation and first light, the important um, commissioning and science verification stages. Um, these chapters include an account of some of the immensely dedicated work and unique solutions that were found so that DCAM could attain the best possible images. For example, um, donuts. Then there was the problem of how to process and store the huge amounts of data coming in every night. So the role of the NCSA in Nabana Champagne, the Brazilian run DES Science Portal, and the story behind the game-changing source extractor software. And finally, there's a chapter on uh, survey strategy and calibration, which is fascinating, absolutely central to the success of an astronomy survey. Um, part two is all about dark energy science, which was the main motivation behind the project. There's a It looks like Lucy froze. Uh, there you go. Um, okay. So maybe perhaps we can move to the next speaker and then when Lucy comes back, uh, she can resume her, her slides. So next we have with us Richard Ellis, who is a professor of astrophysics at University College London and a fellow of the Royal Society. Okay, well, um, I should first explain that although I'm at UCL, I am not a member of the Dark Energy Survey team. So I am in no way uh, involved in this book. However, I am familiar uh, with dark energy since I was a member of one of the two supernova teams uh, in the 1990s uh, that led to its discovery and the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. And let me tell you just a little bit about that story. Our discovery in 1999 uh, that the rate of expansion of the universe is speeding up was a complete surprise uh, to all team members. We set out in 1990 to measure the rate at which the universe was slowing down, uh, fully thinking that gravity is the dominant force that governs the fate of the universe. And we got it wrong. Uh, the rate of expansion of the universe is speeding up. Um, and dark energy is a moniker, um, a label uh, that, uh, for, 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 this, uh, pro, uh, for this result, uh, that we don't yet understand. So what could it be? Uh, it could be an unforeseen property of space. Uh, consider if by some magic I got a very powerful vacuum cleaner and I removed all the material from a box of space and then I put my hands around it and I found to my surprise uh, that it was pushing outwards. Uh, why would that be? Alternatively and equally bewildering, it could be that 
Einstein's theory of gravity, which works so well in the solar system and around black holes, doesn't function properly on the very larger scales in the universe. Now, it may be scandalous to challenge Einstein, but as a British scientist, let me remind you that when Einstein was on the scene, uh, people thought it was scandalous to challenge Newton. So, you know, that's the scope of the discovery space. It seems impossible to imagine that there's anything other than new physics in dark energy. And so dark energy is probably the biggest adventure uh, in physics for over a hundred years. So this book, which I reviewed uh, for World Scientific, describes the inspirational story of how 400 astronomers and instrumentalists came to together to construct this monster megapixel camera that you saw uh, in the introduction and the associated optics and software and place it on an existing telescope very economically uh, in Chile to make a three-dimensional map of over 300 million galaxies. Now, there'll be some Australian uh, listeners, and let me just put this in perspective, they will have heard, no doubt, of the two-degree field survey, which I and Offa Lahav and many others on, on the, on the, on the uh, web tonight with us uh, will remember. And that really was an ambitious program to chart the distribution of a mere quarter of a million galaxies. So we've gone from a quarter of a million galaxies to 300 million galaxies, uh, basically in just over 15 years or so. That's remarkable progress, technically and scientifically, I'm sure you'll agree. So this team is big science. This is what astronomy is now, it's big science. We're talking about 25 institutions in seven countries all motivated by this one big question, what is dark energy? 17 years of effort by some of the world's most talented astronomers. And as Lucy mentioned, it's a unique story because this book you know, covers every aspect of this remarkable story, defining the quest, designing the instrument, forming the international team, raising $40 million, planning the survey over six years, and most important, of course, analyzing the results and making sure that everything is correct. And remarkably, they're inspired not just by a fundamental scientific question, but by poets and artists who exceptionally have been swept up in this remarkable fervor to study this amazing question. And as with all successful scientific adventures, there are surprises, things that they never imagined that they would discover near-Earth asteroids that thankfully never collided with the Earth, um, the detection of bursts of light associated with the very first gravity waves received from two merging neutron stars in a distant galaxy. So let me recommend this book. The Dark Energy Survey Story is a fascinating record of modern big science, which astronomy has now become. It encapsulates the ambitions, the disappointments, the struggles, and eventual success of an international scientific endeavor. What resonates personally with me um, is reading about the concerns of young people, young researchers who wondered, you know, what am I doing in this survey? You know, I'm de dedicating a decade of my life to this. What if it's a complete waste of time? Well, they can now relax and rest assured that they're gonna have a, a, their place in history. This book is an astonishing achievement and it's an excellent documentary of science at its very best. Over to you, Andrea. Thank you very much, Richard. And it seems like Lucy is back, so perhaps she can resume. Right, well, I'll try and resume. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen? So we've been through, um, well, I'll share my screen again. Maybe that was the problem. I'll try again. Um, so we got to dark energy science. We've done building dark energy. Then there was the dark energy, oh wait, sorry. <laughs> dark energy science. And then I'll just quickly go on. So we had part three. Um, so the data from an astronomy survey with a fantastic multiband camera can be used for any number of purposes. And the non-dark energy science has turned out to be just as interesting as the cosmology. 
Um, so this beautiful image was is actually Comet Lovejoy, and it was taken by accident by DCAM in 2014, and you can clearly see the shape of the CCDs. The resolution of the camera is so good, it can be used to study objects spanning a redshift space from the nearby universe to the far distant. There's been new and exciting work done in galaxy evolution, quasars, strong gravitational lensing, Milky Way science, and solar system science, including the discovery of a new dwarf planet nicknamed Didi. The science and the strategies within all these areas are explained and the enthusiasm of the scientists shines through. This final chapter discusses gravitational waves and includes um, what Richard just mentioned, the wonderful story behind the DES optical follow-up to the detection of gravitational waves from colliding neutron stars, which I think Antonella is going to tell, tell us more about maybe. Um, <laughs> and finally, there is a reflections and outlook section, which mostly comprises non-scientific work that's been inspired by the work in DES. So the idea of putting a camera on a telescope and pointing it at the sky to see what we can find is one that stimulates the imagination of people from a wide range of disciplines. Thus, we have an anthropological study of the scientists in DES. A philosopher of science reflects on the wide use of the Bayesian method in cosmology. There's a chapter by two artists who spent time at the observatories at Saratololi on Kitt Peak and used this as inspiration for their artwork. And this piece is called Dancing with Sirius, Lines of Light. It's in chapter 25. And there's an extract from the poem written by the poet who became involved with Des. And then the book concludes with a chapter that sums up the dark energy survey and the current state of cosmology and looks to the future of dark energy studies. So in summary, I would agree with um, Richard. I think this book will be of interest to a wide spectrum of people, including the general community of astronomers and physicists, funding agencies, policymakers, social scientists, and in fact, anyone with an interest in cosmology um, and astrophysics, contemporary cosmology, cosmology. So at every step of this project, ingenuity, creativity, and persistence to push forward what was previously attainable. And this book is an invaluable document of this achievement. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Now we can move to uh, Nigel Sharp, who is the Programme Director at the National Science Foundation, the Division of Astronomical Sciences. Well, greetings. I don't have any presentation. Let me just say good whatever time of day it is in whichever zone you're in. And welcome to this launch of a very interesting book. Just like uh, offer, I have my copy sitting here. It doesn't show up in the Zoom background. Oh well. I think people will find it very interesting. It's the science in it is is sufficiently technical for astronomers, but it's also sufficiently well explained for non-astronomers. And there's a great deal of sociological information about the people involved. I joined the National Science Foundation in 2002, and in 2003 was handed the first parts of what became the Dark Energy Survey as requests for funding. And I thought it was a good idea, but I was promptly disabused of funding it immediately on the grounds that we didn't actually know the entire project. So we then had to spend significant time and effort going through review getting together with the Department of Energy, which was interested in building the camera and working out the collaboration. And we, we learned a lot as we worked through it. And it's been really great to watch it happen over the years, to watch the different results coming out, to see the different groups working together. So I'm very happy that we've reached this point. I look forward to the science continuing to come out of it and to the projects that are, will be inspired by this, by this uh, survey and its results. And I think you can't go far wrong by reading it. And uh, I recommend it to all of you. And I'll just hand that back to Andrea. Thank you very much, Nigel. Now we can move to another editor of this title, Josh Freeman who is the head of department in the theoretical astrophysics group at Fermilab and also professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago. He served as a director of the Dark Energy Survey. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, you still have the Dark Energy, the book up, you're not, so you're not seeing the speakers uh, on the, at least not on, on my screen. I don't know if you wanna switch back to speaker mode yeah, or not. of course. Okay. Now I see you, which is great. Uh, we can so see it, so that's fine. Okay, but you, you're you're the main you're the main you're on the main screen. So just for future speakers, I uh, should be aware of that. Um, 
So it's good to be with all of you today virtually. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ofer and Lucy and Julian and all the many contributors uh, and of course World Scientific for putting this book together. As you heard, it only cost $40 million to make this book, so it was relatively cheap. Uh, and I especially want to thank Ofer for his vision and dedication in really coming up with the idea for this book and, and really shepherding it uh, through a long process. Um, I want to first actually not talk about the dark energy survey. I think I, I want to acknowledge that you know, we're all living through challenging times, really uh, unique times, I think, in, in my life. Uh, a global pandemic is ravaging all parts of the world. Uh, climate change is exacerbating the severity of storms and floods and wildfires, both here in the US and in Australia and elsewhere. And it's disrupting the cycles of the natural world on a really unprecedented scale. Here in the US, we've seen political and social divisions and a reckoning with racial inequity and injustice that have become open wounds in our society uh, in ways that, again, I've, I haven't seen before. And science is under attack in ways I would never have imagined. So it's in this really, this context of cataclysm and catastrophe that we should ask, you know, wh why should we be pausing to celebrate a book about something as inconsequential as the dark energy survey? And there are many reasons, but to me, the primary one is that we must celebrate it as a small reminder to ourselves and to the world of what we are all capable of. The subtitle of the book is, is the story of a cosmological experiment. But I think it also could have been subtitled the story of a scientific collaboration. It's the story of how less than a handful of us and eventually many hundreds of us came together over what's now 17 years and counting with the critical support of a number of government agencies, including the National Science Foundation with Nigel, uh, as well as the Department of Energy and other national agencies to create really a, a technological marvel, the dark energy camera and its database. That's given us insight about hundreds of millions of galaxies spread over billions of light years across the universe and thousands of supernovae and other transient phenomena. And it's the story of how scientists from around the globe are using those data to understand not only why the expansion of the universe is speeding up, as Richard and others talked about, but many other astrophysical questions as well. The dark energy survey data, which we're still mining for scientific insights and will be for the next few years, will be a rich legacy for scientists for years to come. But I believe equally important is the legacy of how we've done this. And that's described in the book as a voluntary collaboration of scientists supported by dedicated teams of engineers and technicians, support staff, laboratories, universities, agency program managers, all of whom came together with a common purpose to address fundamental questions about the universe. And I think it's that collective passion and curiosity, which is the heart of the practice of science harnessed for the good of advancing knowledge. That's one of the great achievements and hallmarks of our civilization. So by celebrating this story today, I think we're helping to keep this endeavor alive and healthy for the future of humanity. Thank you, and back to you, Andrea. And you're Thank you very much, Josh. So now we're moving to Rich Krohn, who is a professor of astronomy at University of Chicago. He served as the project director of the Dark Energy Survey. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers of the event uh, and, and uh, World Scientific uh, for the invitation to give uh, a few words. Uh, some of this will be redundant with respect to what other speakers have already said. But, um, so I, I'd like to address sort of the, uh, the larger um, uh, sort of the DES as, as a whole. Um, so there, there's the book is a very comprehensive uh, in, in terms of, of covering all the numerous parts 
of the project. And I feel honored that I've had uh, some small part in, in some of these things. Um, so some the parts include, uh, among many others, <clears throat> um, building a partnership, uh, which includes the institutions and the agencies, as well as the individual people, uh, securing the resources, constructing the various parts of the camera and integrating them, uh, uh, constructing, uh, sorry, uh, installing and checking uh, the camera at the prime focus of NSF's Blanco telescope at Cerro Tololo, building the data processing pipelines. This is, this is a very long list. Uh, operating the project at Cerro Tololo and in La Serena, uh, in Tucson, in, at NCSA in Illinois, and uh, obviously at Fermilab. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, features of the project was that the, uh, that the membership, the scientific membership of the collaboration was included with the operations by uh, week-long observing shifts in, in Chile. Um, development of advanced and novel analysis methods for cosmology. So with uh, the, the enhanced statistical precision that we have with the enormous amount of data, that means we have to reduce the systematic uh, uh, effects, and that means we have to have better methods. So that's part of uh, what we're doing. Um, continuing on, uh, analysis for cosmology, analysis for other astrophysics, uh, keeping track of hundreds of people working on a hundred projects. Uh, that's no small feat. Uh, and then also vetting and review of intermediate and uh, final products, such as the data themselves and, and journal articles. So so in summary, D DES is a whole system. It's not just the mechanical parts that I would say that the collaboration is no less than a place to foster human creativity. Uh, I think echoing a bit of what Josh was saying. We, we aspire to be a model for other scientific collaborations and, uh, and scientific experiments. So many younger members of DES will graduate to uh, the Rubin Observatory. Um, applying and refining the skills they developed while working in DES. This dynamic of one sky survey supporting another is, is well illustrated by, by the Dark Energy Survey. So the book tells this story well because it, it is an insider's tale. There, there's much to be learned from it. So I thank all of the people who made DES such a success. Uh, I'd like to thank the editors and authors for their enormous effort. Um, and as Josh has already commented, I'd like to thank Ofer Lahav for his uh, remarkable vision in creating the book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rich. Now moving to Alistair Walker, who was the director of the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in La Serena, Chile. When the DCAM project was born, he was also part of various DES committees, and he's currently still affiliated with the observatory and NOAR lab. Oh, hello everyone. So I'm, I'm going to uh, do something just a little different from the previous speakers. So I'm going to give a few personal highlights for myself over the 17 years and counting time that I have been involved with the Dark Energy Survey. And the first highlight, of course, was how it all started, which was absolute pure luck and coincidence when a group of scientists who we might call proto-DES had an idea of doing an experiment that involved building a very large camera and finding a telescope, which they didn't have. And another group of scientists who worked in the observatory who were under huge budget pressure but wanted to build a new instrument for their Blanco telescope. And very luckily, they got together and communicated and, as it were, the rest is history as described in this book. And it's been a long road since then, but I always think that uh, it could have very easily not have happened at all um, uh, from the start. It was then, of course, followed by lots of hard work and the realization, um, certainly realization by us working at the observatory, that this is not just uh, um, a, a, a scientific experiment in the sense of um, a single instrument doing something. You are really building a system. So it's a facility, it's a telescope, it's an instrument, it's a data system, and it's analysis. And everything has got to work properly. And building this is an enormous effort and took many, many years to do. 
until 2012 when we got the first light and the first images and we suddenly realized that this was working absolutely as it was designed and um, we could go on and start doing the science the the other part of it of course was that in fact des was not using all the telescope time so uh, other astronomers outside the des collaboration could spend time at the observatory taking data on this wonderful instrument as well and so the des had provided this uh, wonderful facility and then a couple of years later the first papers started coming out and they've just increased and increased ever since until now the blanco telescope is one of the most scientifically productive astronomical facilities in the world um, and will continue that way as both the ES and the community uh, move on and, uh, and, and do the, the, the more science with the, with the instrument. So I think it's been a, it's a wonderful journey and it's one that hasn't finished yet. And either for us with the instrument still working at Cerro Tololo and the DES with its data still uh, uh, being analyzed and some wonderful results about to come out and also in the, in the, in the years to come. So that's uh, my very brief description of the journey for me. Thank you very much, Alistair. So moving to Tamara Davis, who is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Queensland. She led the dark theme within the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics and helps manage the OSDES working with the International Dark Energy Survey. Thanks very much. Um, let me know if you can see my slides. Yes. Uh, it's been really exciting to be part of this project, the Dark Energy Survey. Um, I'm based in Australia at the University of Queensland, usually. Um, and since I'm here, it's, uh, we usually um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, on which we meet. So I'd like to acknowledge the Turbul and Yagara people, which is where I work at University of Queensland. And uh, I wanted to um, tell a story that um, from the Aboriginal astronomy that is really interesting from the perspective of dark energy science. And that's the fact that here in the Southern Hemisphere, we get a better um, view of the Milky Way galaxy than the Northern Hemisphere. We get the Southern part of Earth is pointed towards the center of the Milky Way. And so we get the, the beautiful sky of the Milky Way with the dark patches of the dust lanes across it. And some of the um, constellations acknowledged in the uh, Aboriginal traditions are um, use the dark patches rather than the bright lights to define their constellations. And when I first heard this, I thought this was uh, spectacular because having grown up in the European tradition with using the bright points of constellations to make pictures in the sky, the idea that you would look at the dark patches instead and those would be the most important things um, sort of blew my mind. And it, it has, relates, I guess, to our dark energy survey because we're looking at the dark things in the sky and trying to understand um, how they work. So you can see the emu, emu right now? Yes. So, excellent. Okay, so I thought I'd just give a quick um, zip through a tiny bit of the science that we're doing. Um, and this is, we, we're looking at multiple dark patches of the sky, not just dark energy. Um, these features of the universe, and this is my grand summary of the difference between dark matter and dark energy, is dark matter pulls, it clumps together, it holds the galaxies together, whereas dark energy appears to be potentially smoothly distributed and is accelerating the universe apart. These two competing forces sort of, sort of helped to make a lot of the structure that we see in the universe today. Now to understand them, we have to measure them in different ways. And the dark energy camera is just an absolutely phenomenal instrument to do this. Um, uh, 570 megapixel camera, it's on in a beautiful site and it can get um, massive patches of the sky in one go. This is approximately the size of the full moon compared to one of the pictures that we see. Um, and you can get images of just spectacular resolution across a, a huge, bit of the sky, which is why this is such a powerful instrument uh, 
uh, to do cosmology with. Now, here in Australia, we have a complementary instrument, which is one of the things that um, I was involved with and Chris Lidman, who's uh, about to speak as well. Um, and that was the two degree field um, robot here. And this is on the Anglo-Australian telescope. And you can see what the robot's doing right now is putting optical fibers at positions of interest. Interesting things are that we want to let in more detail. And then we get the light, we capture the light from individual galaxies in individual optical fibers, take them and from the spectrum of light to figure out how fast they're moving away and a lot of other features that helps us um, understand the universe. And the reason this was a really good partnership between the Anglo-Australian Telescope and um, DECCAM here, uh, and one of the ways that we got involved is because they have basically the, exactly the same field of view. And by you following up um, exciting discoveries from DES, we could do all sorts of really cool things with the extra information from the two different telescopes. One of the cool things that we did was look for supernovae. Um, and you can see if you zoom in, here's one of the really cool ones that we found. That little dot that just appeared is a, a supernova that went off in a nearby galaxy. Uh, and we found, um, we found tens of thousands of um, variable objects and a couple of thousand of supernovae that we're going to be able to use for cosmology. And one of my students, uh, Sam Hinton, made this wonderful visualization where this is, imagine that we're at the center here, we're looking out along four narrow pencil beams into the universe. The distance of the most dist that goes to the most sort of where this intensity of light drops off, that's a redshift of one for those in the know, which means it's about half the age of the universe ago. So the light that, that at that point has been traveling towards us for more than half, uh, more than half the age of the universe. And it's, um, and uh, that means that the, the, each dot the galaxy, sorry, I forgot to say that. Um, and the sparkles that you're seeing are supernovae that are exploding in the um, um, time of our survey. So these are some of the thousands of supernovae that we saw explode. Um, it's, we looked, it's beautiful. We're actually looking at light and looking at events that happened before the earth even formed. So that's, uh, uh, my talk's a nice pretty picture of a, um, a tree uh, because there's a great analogy I think here. 200 years ago um, we didn't know what the air was made of. We see the leaves of trees blowing around but we didn't have the periodic table. We didn't have, know what carbon and oxygen and nitrogen were. We couldn't explain. We can see dark energy and dark matter by the movement of galaxies but we don't know what dark matter and dark energy are. And trying to figure out that is sort of like, I guess, trying to figure out the periodic table and the, all of the elements, who knows what we'll know uh, in a decade, a hundred years, a couple of hundred years time. It's exciting. Um, and oh, to echo the words of the others, one of the most fantastic parts of this collaboration has been the collaboration. The people that we get to work with are um, spectacular, inspired and inspiring people. And that's one of the great things about doing science in these international groups. Thank you very much, Tamara. Now we're moving to Chris Lidman, who is affiliated with the Australian National University, is a director of the Siding Spring Observatory and the leader of the OSDES. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning to some and uh, good evening to others. <clears throat> I'd like to first thank the organisers uh, for inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, exciting uh, book launch. Uh, as uh, Personally, I, I became involved uh, in the Dark Energy Survey at a meeting in Philadelphia uh, way back in uh, 2011. Uh, at that time, it was uh, one year before the first uh, data with uh, the Dark Energy camera was obtained. So it was a, a very busy and a, a very exciting time. As noted by Tamara, the, the contribution that uh, the Australian contingent made to the Dark Energy Survey was to obtain redshifts uh, for thousands of galaxies that hosted type 1a supernova. One of the four probes that the Dark Energy Survey uses to probe dark energy. Uh, we used a, a novel instrument uh, called 2DF and hopefully in my background you can see uh, an image of uh, 
uh, taken with the Daikinji camera, together with uh, about 400 points showing the objects that were targeted with 2DF in this particular instance. As noted by Tamara, 2DF is a robot that can position uh, up to 400 fibers over an area which closely matches the deck cam field of view. Observation started in 2012, uh, the time that uh, DES also started taking data and ended in 2019. As for the observations with DEC cam in Chile, the observations at the Anglo-Australian Telescope or AAT involved teams of astronomers, both young and old, going to the telescope to collect data. Although as the years rolled on, more and more of the observations were taken remotely. The observations involved many young researchers, and I think this is one of the, the great things that, of the Dark Energy Survey, um, is the way it's been able to involve young researchers. It's been great for students. Um, they've been, they become part of a, a worldwide scientific community that both nurtures them, but also challenges them as well. While the DERS survey came to an end in 2019 after six observing seasons, observations of some of the, the fields targeted by the Dark Energy Survey continue to this day, both with the Dark Energy Camera at the, the CTO 4 meter and also 2DF on the AAT. These observations build on a great survey, great legacy of DES. I wanna thank my colleagues here in Australia and my colleagues beyond Australia for the work that we did together. It has been a great journey, a journey that will continue um, with the Vera Rubin Observatory over the next 10 years. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Chris. Now we can move to Luis da Costa, who is the director of the Laboratorio Interinstitucional de Astronomia and the Brazil representative in the Dark Energy Survey Management Committee. Oh, is he not with us anymore? He's muted. I'm sorry. I'm ah. sorry. I had it mute. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Hello, everyone. Uh, like uh, she said, I'm a representative of the S Brazil Consortium, which includes scientists from different institutes of Brazil. Uh, we joined the S back in 2006, 2007, and it has been quite an enjoyable experience and uh, definitely a very fruitful collaboration in many ways. Above all, it has uh, been a most valuable learning experience for our younger scientists, both from science and also in the sociology of these big collaborations. I've been working in the field for over 40 years and uh, in the 80s and 90s, I was involved together with friends at CFA in redshift surveys in what at the time was considered a, a very large international project. It involved a couple of institutions, a dozen researchers and a budget under $100,000. Papers had maximum 15 authors. So participating in the S was quite a different. And uh, I'm glad uh, Ofer had the idea of registering the experience in the form of the book. Uh, I have to strongly recommend this book to young scientists because it is important for them to learn the great science he, he requires not only a great idea, but a great organization to make it happen. And they need to know to work in this kind of a collaborative environment, much different from what we did in the past. Uh, I take the opportunity also to thank a few people explicitly because people that I have been very impressed by their work and by the contribution they have done for this project. First of all, the four editors of the, the, this, this book, because uh, I know that uh, that had, must have required incredible determination, patience to get a, all of us to contribute the chapters that we were supposed to write. Uh, all the three directors, John Peoples, Josh Freeman, Richard Crom, for their leadership in the different phases of the project, each one with their own challenges. Uh, Ofer, for his contribution, stitching together this collaboration in the early days, in the early days, uh, together with other people. Tom, Tom Dio, for his enthusiasm and dedication over the years, to especially coordinating the observations of a six year period or more. Alistair Walker and the crew at CTIO for their amazing work of keeping the whole thing operational for this uh, length of time. It's not easy to keep a team up to speed for such a long period of time. 
and also to all the DS members for a very collegial atmosphere, which actually has made a lot of difference. Finally, I would like to recognize the role of people like Nigel and Kathy Turner. I wish I, I, we had in Brazil the kind of relationship between funding agencies and projects I witnessed uh, over the years at, uh, at the DS. I have to congratulate them because they make things work. They, they, they really have helped. And I just want to make a comment that I must be much older than Richard Ellis because he was talking about a quarter of a million galaxies. I'm from the time that I got 10,000 galaxies and we were happy about it. <laughs> so things have changed dramatically over the years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, finally, we have Antonella Palmese, who is an astrophysicist at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory and is involved in the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument Project. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for coming today. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be talking about DES and the DES book. In fact, DES is something very important to me because it is through this experiment that I really learned how to do research since I was a master's student and all the way to now as a postdoc. And, and so this experiment really shaped me as a researcher and also as a person. Uh, and, uh, and about the book, I would like to say that it does feel like yesterday that I remember author starting to tell me about his idea of the book. I think it was 2014 uh, when I was at UCL and later Lucy coming to shadow us pretty much at most local meetings at the collaboration meeting and interviewing us one by one back at UCL and spending so much time studying how we were studying uh, the universe through the dark energy survey. And so I think it's great that Lucy did a lot of that work and, and got to see that part of the experiment and that I hope that also the readers will be able to catch some of that part of the experiment, the human part, all of the interactions, the collaboration meetings, and I'm pretty sure for, that for most of us in DS, the collaboration meeting was, and hopefully will be soon, uh, when it will be able to have another one in person again, uh, was one of the most exciting time of the year. And that's, you know, the moment when you have all of us, all of the about 100 usually astronomers would get together in the same place and just talk about how we could advance our understanding of the universe. Um, so that's where most of the science uh, would start, would happen, new projects, new ideas. And it was even much more to people like me, to the early career scientists, because that's where we got to learn how to apply for a job, how to write a research proposal, or what even our career options would be outside of academia. Uh, so now I think I, I should say a few words about the chapter that relates more to, to my field of study, uh, which talk, talks about some of the greatest science that DES was able to do even without knowing before that that's something that they would have been able to do. So uh, as you heard, you know, people started designing this experiment maybe 15 years ago or so. Uh, and so that was well before the first detection of gravitational waves. Um, and so uh, the idea uh, of using the dark energy survey to, to study gravitational waves is that we can do a gravitational wave follow-up. Uh, so gravitational wave detectors, so other experiment that in a way can hear the sound or better can, can detect the ripples of space time uh, that are caused by some uh, collisions such as collisions between two neutral stars or two black holes. Um, so as you can imagine, if two black holes collide, uh, it's not that obvious that you would see any flash of light coming from it unless there's maybe some material around it. Um, but in the case in which two neutron star collides, then you do expect to see some flash of light in the sky. And so uh, that's what the gravitational wave follow-up does. It looks for these flashes of light in the sky uh, coming from the direction where a gravitational wave uh, event was detected. And some, this is something that we have been able to do with the Dark Energy Survey. And, uh, and so this is a really new field. We were able to, to detect for the first time the collision between neutron stars in, in 2017. And DES and the DESGW, the DES Gravitational Wave Search Team in which I'm, I'm heavily involved has been one of the few teams to, that were able to discover the, the first and so far also the last, uh, as we call it, counterpart. So the, the flash of light coming from uh, the collision uh, detected in gravitational waves. So that was a, an awesome moment to be involved in that effort. We worked very, very hard to finish all of the analysis in a record time of about two months. And uh, that, that's really fast if you think about the typical analysis that we do in DES, they really take years. Uh, so that's why we're still analyzing data, for example, from back in 2016, 
at this time. And we're still working with the full data set um, to hopefully get some results out very soon. Um, so, so yeah, and it turns out that even with this uh, gravitational wave follow-up, we've also been able to, to make cosmological measurements with this type of events that in the end is what the dark energy survey was, was built for. So that's, that was amazing, I think. Um, and so since then, a lot has happened. And we are still continuing to use uh, the dark energy camera. So the, the, the instrument that was used for the dark energy survey uh, until now, and we continue to do gravitational wave follow-ups. And so that's something that I still do. I, I operate the dark energy camera remotely, unfortunately, these days, uh, just from home. Uh, and I would really rather be in this magical place that you see in my background. This is a view from the dining room at Cerro Tololo. It's a, it's a very great place. Um, so uh, with this, I hope that people will get to know more about DES and the history of the dark energy survey in the book. And I'll leave the word to Andrea. Thank you very, very much, Antonella. We do seem to have time for some questions. So the first question would be for, I mean, I, mean, I think Lucy uh, would be best if she answered this. So the question is, um, this survey is transdisciplinary and has inputs from philosophers, anthropologists, visual, visual artists and poets. Could esoteric or spiritual aspects be included? Uh, well, they're not included in the book. I mean, I don't see why they couldn't be included. <laughs> I mean, the thing about um, cosmology that obviously it's, you know, it's interesting to, it's a, it's a spiritual, it's a, a spiritual and esoteric activity as much as it's a scientific activity, isn't it? The, what's the meaning of life and what, what's it all about? But this book specifically is about um, science and social anthropology, you know, this uh, social science and um, art and, you know, sort of human endeavors, I'd say, rather than going into spiritual and esoteric because I think there's enough of, of that kind of thing. And I think we want to actually try and bring out what is um, amazing and beautiful about science and, um, and what, you know, human endeavor and what we can find out, uh, our theories, how they can relate to the natural world around us. I think that is actually, to me, is just as incredible as anything um, spiritual, but <laughs> that's my own opinion. So yeah, so you won't find anything spiritual in this book, but obviously, you know, that is very inspiring to, to people, uh, cosmology, so. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lucy. One other question. Will there be a resource or website for new results from the Dark Energy Survey as they become available in future? Yeah, perhaps I could answer that. Uh, so yes, indeed, uh, the, the, the data are, uh, are freely available or, or, or will be freely available uh, very soon. Um, for anybody to look at, uh, for any uh, um, any scientific application, um, it's uh, thanks to help from the National Science Foundation, thanks uh, for, uh, from our partners in Brazil, um, and thanks for the the team at uh, the National uh, Supercomputer uh, Center for Supercomputer Applications. So it's a big it's a big project. We take the public distribution of data very as a very important part of our mission. Thank you. Uh, one question for perhaps Joshua Offer. Is the dark energy just Einstein's lambda? Josh, please go ahead. I can add a few comments later. Yeah, so that's the, you know, that's the fundamental question we want to address with the dark energy survey and other surveys. I would say, you know, the data so far are consistent with dark energy being Einstein's lambda, the cosmological constant. Um, but we don't know. And that was, you know, that's one of the key questions we wanted to address. Uh, we're still analyzing the data. Uh, and even after we get a provisional answer, as was mentioned, there will be future surveys uh, from the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, WFIRST, Euclid, uh, the DESI survey, which has just started, which will all provide additional information on this. So I'd say uh, you know, it's consistent so far with that, but, um, but I think the jury is still out. I just wanted to add one thing. Somebody commented that there are Facebook and Twitter pages, the Dark Energy Survey, which is true. I actually find quite useful snippets on YouTube as well. There are little videos, uh, vignettes of the project. 
Um, and I there's often the Dark Energy Survey website too. On. I often find out more about what's going on that way. <laughs> right. Was there something you wanted to add, Alpha? Well, well, just to say that uh, really we, we don't know, even if it turns out to be just Lambda, uh, that's by itself still very intriguing because we don't quite know what is the meaning of that. Um, and there are different levels of problems there. Uh, whether it's a uh, part of uh, gravity, it's some modification of gravity, or is it so-called vacuum energy? Um, and why is the vacuum energy we measure is so small compared to what particle physicists tell us it should be? So I think either way, if, if this, the dark energy survey plus the future surveys categorically say it's just lambda, I think it's, it's, it's amazing by itself and it needs explanation and hopefully great minds can help us with this. Uh, if it's a deviation, it's going to be even more, uh, more, more exciting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question that could be for Rich. What do we expect from the rest of dark energy survey data? We're, we are <clears throat> currently still working on the, the year three, in other words, the first three years of, uh, of information that we collected with the camera. Uh, we're getting close to uh, having a um, sort of a summary of, of the constraints on the cosmological parameters that uh, we were just talking about. Uh, and then uh, we'll move on to year six. So the full six years of data. So there's, there's much more work to be done um, and it will take a while. Uh, meanwhile, uh, many of our colleagues in the project will be working on things that are not the, cosmo uh, the constraints on the cosmological parameters, but on other kinds of astrophysics. So, I, uh, so Antonella made, mentioned uh, the gravitational wave um, uh, uh, source uh, follow-up, and uh, there, there's just going to be, uh, I could also mention uh, that the distribution of of uh, dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way is another uh, topic that uh, Des has been making many contributions to, and I think that will continue. Um, so we are, uh, we're just starting, we're just starting. Great, thank you. And, oh, will there be a book volume two that will describe how the Dark Energy Survey, survey came out? <laughs> Okay, volunteers to write the next book. <laughs> it might be oh, all of the, oh, the papers. Volunteer. Sorry, Tamara, you were going to say something. It might be all of the huge volume of papers that we release and all of the, um, the um, website pages and news articles and things that we write about it. I'm sure there's going to be lots more coming from uh, DES in that form. Uh, somebody will have to distill that into a comprehensible form. We'll make it comprehensible. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, oh, someone's asking, what was the biggest surprise? <laughs> that we got it done, Carl, that we got it done. <laughs> I, I should add, you know, people have mentioned 40 million, but by the time you add up all the contributions and so on, this is a hundred million dollar project. It wasn't quite that cheap a book. <laughs> nice to see you, Carl. It's been a while. <laughs> Anyone else want to add something else? Sorry, somebody should give a real surprise. <laughs> Well, I, I, I could say that um, I, I watched the planning for the gravitational wave follow-up, uh, the, the, the optical, the electromagnetic uh, uh, source follow-up uh, from the beginning. And uh, it was an extraordinary thing to watch the, the team that uh, Antonello was, uh, was describing that sort of put ideas together of how can we use this camera, how can we use the operations of, of the survey to do something that was completely different from anything that had been uh, considered at the at the beginning of the survey, and um, uh, it was a, an extraordinary thing to see that the, all of these intricate plans of how this was going to be done 
actually happened in, in reality. So the, the actual event was exactly the way this team uh, was, was planning for. So I was, uh, I, I found that very gratifying. <clears throat> Thank you both. Um, so we have time for one last question. Um, so this would be for Lucy. How do you see the future interaction between cosmology and the arts highlighted in part four? Um, well, I think it's very important actually to, to continue to have an interaction between cosmology and the arts, um, especially, you know, science is changing. Um, well, it's changed, doesn't it? it used to be, it used to be sitting alone in, in, in institutions and countries. Um, I'm just not sure if anyone can hear anything I'm saying. Um, you know that we, we need basically keep an eye on these. Okay, it looks like Lucy dropped out. Uh, Okay, then um, the, there are no other questions. Uh, one announcement that I want to make is that we are actually offering a discount for this title, which I'm going to show on the screen in just one second. There you go. So we are actually offering 30% discount on this title on the World Scientific website for all formats. So all you need to do is go on our website. Um, you can also scan uh, the QR code on, on the screen. Go on our website and if you use the code WSDE30 until the end of December, you can enjoy 30% discount on all formats on this title. So thank you very much for everyone who's joined us today. And first of all, I, I would like to thank the speakers for accepting our invitation. I know everyone is very busy, so I, we really appreciate this. Um, and as well, uh, I would like to thank or everyone who, who made the time to, to join us today. If anyone else wants to add anything,